the title of the message today is The Body of Christ. So if you have your Bibles open, let's pick it up in verse 12. It says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. In Corinthians, Paul's been speaking to the church, and he gives them illustrations. And a couple weeks ago, we looked in chapter 9 where he gave us a picture of an Olympic athlete and compared that to a Christian life. And then here in chapter 12, Paul gives us the picture of the human body, because you all have one, and to illustrate the church functioning together. And what he's saying is, we are all part of the body of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the head of the body. And, and uh, this is the system that God created for the purposes of God to be accomplished. And I think that's important because sometimes people think, well, what's the point of the church? Well, in Ephesians 4.15, he says, uh, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, that's speaking of the church, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, speaking of each of us, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So he's saying the church, every part does its share, each person, edifying itself in love. So the church is designed by God to function together as the body of Christ, to do the work of the kingdom of God. And, and that's important to understand because sometimes people get the idea that church is a preacher who preaches and people who come and watch and leave. And that, that's not really what the church is. In fact, in Hebrews 10, 24, it says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more the, uh, as you see the day approaching. In other words, we're to get together at church, and we are to encourage one another uh, in love and good works. We're to stir one another up. Now, it doesn't say we get to church and one person does the stirring and everybody else does the sitting, right? It's like we work together and all of us need to be encouraged, right? And, and everybody uh, goes through difficulties in life and uh, we all need to be encouraged and refreshed. And sometimes people don't realize that they need encouragement and sometimes people don't realize that they need the body of Christ because we live in a culture where people think I'm independent. I don't need anybody to help me. I can do it all by myself, but that's not what the Bible says, how the church is to function. And when the enemy tells you you don't need anybody else, well, that's not a biblical truth, right? So Paul says in verse 12, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body and so also is Christ. So as a church, we are to be demonstrating to the world what the body of Christ is like, right? And not just Calvary Chapel, but all the different churches. And, and I'm thankful for all the churches that love the Lord, and whether they're non-denominational or denominational, those who seek God and follow God. But here's the thing. God gives us a variety of styles, and that's why it's good to find a church that you fit in with, right? I mean, uh, and, and what Paul's saying in verse 15, he says, if the foot should say, because I am not the hand, and I am not the, uh, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Or if the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the whole were a hear, uh, a whole were hearing, where would be the smelling, right? And so Paul's saying like in your physical body, you need every part. You need your hand, your ears, your eyes, your nose, right? And it's interesting that he starts out with the foot, right? <laughs> because, uh, you know, the foot is the part of the body that has the right to complain. You imagine in those days, they didn't have electric cars with rolling blackouts, you know, uh, and, and the foot had to carry the load, right? Walk around, imagine the feet were hot and sweaty in the summer and freezing cold in the winter, and you had to walk everywhere, and I'm sure that the feet hurt all the time, right? Maybe maybe your feet hurt, and you're like, uh, you know, and you just think, you know, he's saying, is the foot not part of the body? Is the foot saying, hey, I'm tired of carrying the load here, I'm out. I don't want to be the foot anymore. I want to be an ear where we hang dangly, shiny things, diamonds on me, Right? Now, now, he's given this, this illustration because we all have these parts, right? It's an, it's an analogy. Now, Paul is not saying that you are a foot, right? You are a child of God. You're not a toe. Uh, you're not a toenail. Uh, you are a foot. It's an illustration that you realize that you have different parts of your body, and so you can compare your physical body to the body of Christ, and you get this idea that there are parts that have different functions, right? Your foot has a different function than your ear, and your hand has a different function than your nose. You can't smell very well with your hand, right? And so the idea is that every part is essential. 
Every part in the body of Christ is essential. Now, why does he tell us this? Well, because people can come to church and think, I'm not important, and my part doesn't matter. Who cares if I come? Well, God cares. God needs you. He created you. And so, you know, the Christians in Corinth, they were not happy with their particular gift in the body of Christ. Some of them wanted to be something else. And Paul is saying that the feet are just as important as the eye, right? And uh, he's saying that the feet are important because the feet carry the gospel, right? In Romans uh, 10, 14, he said, how will they call on him of who they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they uh, hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they're sent? And it, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. Now, have you thought about that before? How beautiful are the feet of those? How many of you thought about Billy Graham's feet or, or Greg Laurie's feet? Right? I mean, it's like, uh, see, the truth is, is that every part is important, right? Your feet get you to where you bring the gospel. And, and we need to never think that Whatever my part is, it's not important. What he's saying, every part is important. Verse 8, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. Now, what he's saying in verse 8, you need to you know, make a note of this mentally. God has set the members. In other words, God created you the way you are with a purpose and a plan for your life. You are unique, you are different, and he has a plan for you, he has things for you to do. Now, just because you're not like somebody else, that doesn't mean that he doesn't have a plan for you. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. So when you think about it, Ephesians 2.10 clearly states that God created you for a purpose. And what is that purpose? For good works. And, and, and it says beforehand, before you were born, God knew your life. He knew what you were going to do. God knows your future. He knows what's coming in your future. And God is preparing you for the good works that you should walk in in the future. And it's very comforting to realize that God has a plan for my life. He has a plan for your life. And all the things that he allows into our lives are to prepare us for the things that are coming in the future, right? He is preparing us. And, you know, uh, it, it is crazy to think that you, you are being prepared right now for things that are coming later. But we're all just moving along. And whether you believe it or whether you agree with it, you are moving along in life, right? Things are changing. And here's the good news. God is preparing you for the things that are coming, no matter what age you're at. You know, if you're 65 and you think, well, I'm near the end, I'm like, oh, no, there's a lot more problems coming with your physical body, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> wherever you're at, right? Whatever stage you are, I mean, it's wonderful to be 22 and think you know everything, right? But that's not really the truth, <laughs> right? I mean, you're going to have some children and then you know, things will change, right? It's amazing how as you go through the stages of life, you realize, you know, things that you don't know. I mean, I was just telling Dennis the other day, <clears throat> how can I be this old and have just learned this new thing? But, but that's part of the process. God wants us to be consciously aware that things are changing, and he wants us to be learners. You know what the word disciple means? It means learner. So as you go through life, whether you're 22, 62, or 82, or 92, God wants us to keep learning and keep growing. Now, why? Well, because he has things for us to do at whatever stage. And so he says in verse 20, but now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again to the head, uh, uh, to the feet, I have no need of you, right? So he's communicating to us that everyone in the body of Christ needs each other in the body of Christ to accomplish God's purposes in your life. Now, some people don't understand this truth. What he's saying is you cannot accomplish what God has for you to do without other people in the body of Christ. We need each other. That's so important. Most people not most, but many Christians don't believe that. But the Bible says in Ephesians 4.16, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself. Every part does its share to cause growth. So could Billy Graham do everything that he did by himself? Absolutely not. He needed thousands of other people to help him. Or we did a harvest crusade last year. Uh, could Greg Laurie have preached to 21,000 people in two days without help of other people? No, it was like, I think there was 100 churches, and there were you know, hundreds and hundreds of people that were involved. And just as you could look at a Harvest Crusade or a Billy Graham event, the church is no different. Do you think that this church happens just every Sunday, just with Bob? Do you think I just stroll up here five minutes before church starts and everything works? No, it doesn't work. A lot of people are involved, right? And, and that's with every church, right? And so he says in verse 22, no, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. So 
What he's saying is just like our physical body, sometimes we give greater honor to certain parts, uh, but in reality, other parts are more important, right? I'm sure there are some girls that think their hair is the most important part, right? But in reality, right, if their heart stopped or their lungs stopped, they could care less about their hair, <laughs> right? So there are parts that you can't see physically on your body that are very important. Your lungs, uh, you know, if your intestines stop working, uh, you don't see them, but you're going to be concerned about it. You're not, you're not going to care about doing your hair or your makeup or what clothes you're wearing, right? If those babies stop working, eh, trouble. <laughs> and so, so he's saying just like your physical body, there are parts that you don't see, but they are just as important. And so too in the church, there are many people who do things that just because you don't see them, it doesn't mean that they're not important. But here's the thing. God made you with a purpose. He has a plan for your life. And we're all different. We have different personalities. We have different gifts. And every one of us has different spiritual gifts. Every one of us are created unique and different. And that's on purpose. God did that deliberately. My wife used to say to me, if we were exactly the same, this would be a very boring relationship. <laughs> right? And too often, parts of the body of Christ uh, don't want to function together or don't like the part that they are. Right? And so, you know, you have to realize that just like your physical body from time to time does things that other parts of the body doesn't like. Has your teeth ever bit your tongue? And you're like, ah! And someone says, what happened? You're like, I bit my tongue. I'm like, why would you do a stupid thing like that? I didn't do it. The mouth did it. You know, it's like your brain, right? Or, or, or has your brain ever told you to pick up a cup of something very hot and put it in your mouth and burn your tongue? And then your tongue's like, why did you do that to me? Right? Now, we've all experienced that. And he's saying the body of Christ is much like your physical body. From time to time, people do things that are going to bother you. Sometimes you're going to bite your tongue. But do you rip all your teeth out after your tongue gets bitten? <laughs> How many of you ever thought to yourself, I'm going to the garage getting some pliers, man. You're not biting my tongue ever again. <laughs> you start yanking them out. We don't do that. But here's the thing. Jesus said that we all are to work together just like your physical body works together. And, and he said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. See. When you abide in Jesus Christ, as a normal Christian, part of the normal Christian life is to bear fruit. Now, what does that mean? It means to do good works. It means to, to do things for the kingdom of God, not to earn salvation. We know we're saved by grace through faith, but to fulfill the purpose of our lives. Once you're saved, then you're saved, but then God wants to use you to love people and bless people. In fact, Jesus gave an example in John 13, 14, where he said, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I, as I have done to you. And he washed their feet, and he said, this is an example. Now, what's he saying? He's saying, look, you need to serve people and help people with whatever they need help with. And in the very few verses later, Jesus said in John 13, 17, if you know these things, which all of you do, blessed are you if you do them, right? People come to church and say, you know what, Pastor, I've heard this sermon before. But Jesus didn't say, well, if you know it, you're going to be blessed. He said, if you do it. So the question is, when anyone says to me, I've heard that before, my question is, are you doing it? Because Jesus said, blessed are you if you do them. And that word blessed means happy. Oh, how happy are you if you do it? And what was he talking about? He was talking about washing feet. Well, he wasn't saying specifically washing feet. He's talking about serving people, helping people, loving people. And so what he's saying is, if you want to have a happy, blessed life, then you should be looking for opportunities to serve others, right? That's what Jesus said in Matthew 20, 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but what? But to serve. Jesus came to serve people. Now, somehow people think that the church is made for you to come and be served. But Jesus said, and what is it? What is a Christian? Christ-like, right? A, a little Jesus, right? And so you might think that, well, Pastor Bob, I would love to serve, but I don't have any gifts to serve anybody with, right? But God says that every single person has received a gift. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Using what God has given to you to edify the body of Christ should be a normal part of your Christian life. Church is us as God's people accomplishing the purposes that he created for us before you were born, right? In Romans 12, 6, he says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them, right? So again, it's the doing it, using it. If prophecy, then prophesy in proportion to your faith. If ministry, <clears throat> then use it in our ministering. If teaching, 
uh, he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives, give with liberality, right? So if your gift is to work hard, if you're gifted at business and you make a lot of money and you give to keep the lights on at the church, well, hey, do that, right? We should spend a long time on that. No, we won't. But anyway, right? Uh, right? If you give, give liberally, right? Let it go. Let it flow, right? Uh, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, right? Now, we've gone through all those before, but how does a person find out what is their gift? What, what is it? Well, uh, how you find out is by the Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight, right? You have to take a step of faith and you have to step out and try something. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy 4.14, do not neglect the gift that is in you. Now, why would Paul tell Timothy, who was his assistant and who was very involved in the work of the kingdom, don't neglect the gift that was in you? Because I believe that we have a tendency to neglect the gift that God gives us, right? And we need to pray and say, Lord, help me not to neglect what you've given me. And we, we should want to get involved. Why? Well, because it's why God created us. And in fact, uh, I read uh, <clears throat> in Christianity Today, there was a report that said an estimated 30,000 congregations shut their doors in the United States between 2006 and 2012. 5,000 closures a year. In 2012, there were 384,000 churches in America. At the rate of 5,000 closures a year, it will only take 75 years for all the churches in America to close down. Now, if you think the world is crazy now, what do you think it will be like when all the churches close? Right? My wife tells me that all the time. Man, after the rapture, it is going to be crazy here, right? But, but here's the thing. Why do churches close down? Well, because people think churches, hey, I come, I learn how to be selfish, and then I do my thing and go home, right? No. Uh, church is a place where we use whatever God's given us to help and encourage one another, right? So important that rather than looking at what I don't have and what I can't do, the Bible says you need to look at what you do have and what you can do, right? You need to look at what can I do? And you just need to ask yourself, do you love to clean? If you do, I love you, right? Hey, you should sign up. I mean, the ladies, they're clean in here. I just love it. I love to walk into the church. You know, I come in Wednesday morning and there's a group of ladies just cleaning everything. I'm like, oh, I love it. I love clean, right? And so, just think about your life, how different your Christian life would be if instead of you were thinking, is this the right church for me? Is this pastor good enough for me? If you started praying, Lord, how can I use what you've given me to love other people and to serve other people and help other people, right? Imagine if you started thinking that. Imagine if you started praying that every day, that you got up and said, Lord, show me how I can use whatever you've given me to help other people, right? And, uh, and not just help other people, but, you know, Jesus said, loving those who love you, you know, that's no big deal. Heathen people do that. But loving people expecting nothing in return. Imagine if you started praying and saying, Lord, help me to love people expecting nothing in return. Help me to get to that level. So rather than focusing on what I don't have, we need to focus on, hey, what has God given me? And we're begin to seek God and pray and say, Lord, I know that someone asked you, Jesus, a lawyer asked Jesus, what's the most important thing in the Bible? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, whole heart, mind, soul, and spirit. And you know the next part, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it's not in knowing it that brings the blessing. It's in the doing it. Peter 4.10 says, as each one has received a gift, every one of you has a gift, minister it to one another in the church as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So God wants us to faithfully serve. Now, that's what he's talking about in verse 26 when he says, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So without the Spirit of God, you know, we can't really be empathetic and love people and serve people the way God wants us to. I have a tendency to be selfish and only concerned about myself, right? But we know that selfishness and self-centeredness leads to what? Sadness and confusion about life. If all you think is a Christian about me, 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 what about me? How come they got better than me? How come they got that? How come me, me, right? What does the Bible say? James 3:16. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there, right? So that doesn't really produce the kind of life God wants for you, right? To just be a selfish person. So 2 Corinthians 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So God sends people into our lives to help us when we're going through difficult times. And what he says is that, once God helps you with that same comfort that you were encouraged, you need to comfort other people, right? And that's how the body of Christ should function. It'll change the way you see school, the way you see work, the way you see church, the way you see marriage. If you go to work tomorrow and you're thinking, how can I bless people? How can I be a blessing to people? 
or it's going to change the way you see it. And so when you think about it, that's why most of the ministries at our church go on. And many of us, we do what we do because we recognize that God sent people to encourage us and help us. And, and when we say, God, thank you, I love you, what do you want me to do? You know what he says? I want you to go love other people and help them, right? He doesn't say, go watch Netflix till the rapture, <laughs> right? Nothing wrong with Netflix. But I mean, the point is, is that, you know, Jesus loved people and how he showed it was by serving them. And, and it brought joy to their lives. In, in John 15, 11, <clears throat> Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, how did he love them? He washed their feet. Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus died for us, right? And so Jesus is saying, if you want to have a joy-filled life, it comes through loving other people. And how do you show love to people? By serving them, right? And, and serving people produces a joy-filled life. Why? Well, because that's how God created us. And helping others produces joy not only in your life, but in their life. And the church is a great place to take ventures of faith and try to use whatever resources God has given you to love others, to help others. And here's the good news. It's going to have an eternal impact on them throughout eternity, forever. And you're going to get eternal rewards in heaven for doing the work of God, being part of the body of Christ. And, and really, it does produce a great life. Being a Christian is not a selfish person. Being a Christian is being a loving, giving person. And it produces great joy. That's what he's saying there in, to the church of Philippi. And, you know, I read a book some years ago by uh, Dr. Henry Cloud, and the title of it was The Law of Happiness. And he said that research into happiness shows that circumstances account for only 10% of our happiness. 90% of happiness comes from what's going on inside of you. Now, when I read that, I thought, oh, wow, that's awesome. Why is that awesome? Well, because 90% of your happiness comes from what's going on inside. Now, if your attitude is, Lord, who can I love? Who can I serve? Who can I bless expecting nothing in return? You're going to be a happy person, right? Uh, and, and if your happiness is all like bent on, hey, when everybody does what I want, when I want, and how I want, then I'll be happy. Mm. <laughs> it's like not an optimistic future in that, right? I mean, because really the Lord wired us to be loving, giving people, and that produces joy. And I would just encourage you this morning, if the Lord's been nudging you to step out in faith, to get involved and use whatever talents or resources God's given you, then I would encourage you to do it because it is the place of greatest joy, right? Being selfish and self-centered it's just a never-ending, uh, you know, chasing the end of a rainbow. Oh, I'm almost happy one day. So God has created you unique with a purpose, right? And as he said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.14, do not neglect the gift that is in you. God wants you to use your life to impact this world for his kingdom. If you look at the world and you say, the world is crazy, what can I do? Well, you can start praying and say, God, how can I use whatever you've given me to love other people, to help other people? And you can start by, you know, exercising your gifts here at the church. Because here, people are gracious, right? Whatever it is, right? And God wants to use your life to impact the world. But he's not going to force you. So you have to say, Lord, hey, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And, and when you pray that, and I challenge you to pray that, Lord, what do you want me to do? Open doors for me to serve people, love people, help people. What can I do? Right? There's a guy <clears throat> who does trim in our church. And he's like, hey, I want to serve the Lord. I said, what do you do? I do trim. You want to do trim in the windows? All right, let's do it. And so he's doing trim in all the windows. Like, wow, and it's really awesome. I love it. I come in like, oh, that's beautiful, right? There's a guy who builds cabinets. And, you know, I come in, oh, that's beautiful. <clears throat> People come and clean. People do the words. You know, when Melissa leads worship, I'm sitting in the back, and the words are correct up there. I'm like, oh, I love it that the words are right up there, right? And all of us work together. There's so much to do. But how do we do it? Well, by faith. We just, we just step out in faith. And if God has blessed you, and you want to bless others, then pray and say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me to step out in faith and to use whatever you've given me for your kingdom. And as you do that, it makes your life exciting, right? The, the journey for happiness ends right there because when you start loving in people wherever you're at, it begins to produce joy in your life because that's how God created you, right? The, even today, as you hold the door open for somebody, you're like, oh, that was pretty good, right? I mean, you start with some light lifting, <laughs> loan them a pencil, whatever, but you need to start where you're at. And as you begin to love people and serve people, man, it produces great joy because the Bible says you reap what you sow. And see, when you begin to live your life to love people and help people, your, your family, your wife, your kids, your parents, whoever it is, your spouse, and you begin to just live your life to help and bless people, man, life is so much better. It just produces a, a, a quality of life that's indescribable. And so I would encourage you, wherever you're at in your journey with the Lord, 
to just pray, Lord, help me to step out, help me to do something, whatever it is. And as you do it, you will experience a supernatural work of God in your life that you never could imagine. So do it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. And Lord, we do pray for all of us that you help us, Lord, to seek you, Lord, how we can love others the way you love us. Lord, as you are an example for us, you didn't come to be served, but to serve. Help us, Lord, to be people who don't want to be served, but that we would want to serve others, that we want to love others the way, Lord, that you want us to use our talents and gifts and resources to love others. So we pray, Lord, that you would cause these words to transform our hearts, and Lord, that we would be people who represent you well in our community as the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.